Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Reed. Hall will not be joining us tonight, unfortunately. He is feeling under the weather, so ho- hopefully Hall feels better tonight. He's able to go back to work tomorrow, but the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. This episode is called the OTA Briefing, so we thought, why not bring on our boy Ryan Fowler from the Draft Network to kind of break down what's happened at OTA so far and give us some updates. How are you doing tonight, brother? I'm good. Always appreciate you guys having me on. Yes, sir. And the first question I have to ask you is this Sam Howell at OTAs, not only as what you've heard from how he's performed at OTAs, but the second half of that, the having him mic'd up in the huddle. I don't think this is something that is normal that usually goes around the NFL. Kind of talk about that. Is that something that happens? Yeah, it's uh, something that unique that I've heard, you know, and, and bottom line for Sam, first off, I haven't been out at OTAs, but everything that I've heard of the conversations I've had the individuals in the building is that Sam showcased well. It's not everything's going to be perfect. And I hope Burgundy Gold fans out there don't expect him to come out and be number 15 in Kansas City right. this fall um, because there are going to be some speed bumps. But, yeah, him being mic'd up in the huddle, I love that because bottom line, this guy's really learning his second new offense in two years. Like, you know, you didn't play much last year. I, I like that he was able to sit and have a clipboard in his hands. But Eric Bien, I mean, we know he's going to have the pillars of his offense. But learning brand-new terminology, learning protections – Hopefully he doesn't have to set too many protections and allow him to keep his eyes up on the secondary this year. But having him mic'd up right away, allowing him to, whether he's in the huddle and making calls correctly, incorrectly, allowing to learn right now in OTAs as we sit here in early June. And when it comes September, we work into Arizona and work into divisional games starting with Philly. All of that hopefully is second, you know, second nature to him. So I, I think it's unique. I've never heard of a quarterback mic'd up in the huddle before. I love that. They're trying new things. I think that's really Eric the enemy having his fingerprints on this offense right away, and I love it. Yeah, it really seems like they're pushing the same Hal narrative, and I love that. I, I feel like it's good that they seem to be all in on him. Uh, a lot's been made about Emmanuel Forbes. We hear about Emmanuel Forbes all the time, uh, how well he's been doing. Not a lot's been made about Quan Martin so far. Uh, what are your impressions of him, and what did you feel about him when he was coming out? Yeah, I love Quan Martin. I really do. And every team needs a player like him at that at that big nickel, if you will. And I think he can play press man. I think he can play zone if you want to. And I think it comes down to what teams do offensively, whether they want to run 11 personnel, whether they want to run some 12, 13, or some 02, some 03, and allow them to get bigger. Whether you want to bring Cam Crow into the box, whether you want to have one linebacker on the field, or you want to play Derek Forrest and play Percy Butler, which I think he will get more snaps this year as that center field defender, which he was for Louisiana Lafayette. Um, but I just think overall, Quan Martin is a, is a flat out ball player that can help both in the run game and the passing game where teams want to get their big receivers inside their X receivers, if you will, and have those free releases because they have more space to their left and to their right. So every team needs a player like Quan Martin. I love also how they're using all these corners, both Forbes, Fuller, St. Juice inside and out. That doesn't mean they're going to play inside and out, especially with a manual, but just as far as learning their landmarks and coverage, man versus zone, I think they're going to do a multiplicity of things this year. And I'm really excited to see all of these guys progress into the corners that they really can be because we know the secondary has to flat out be better this year. And Ryan, to piggyback off of that, you know, Quan, you talked about playing in that slot because I personally believe that he is perfectly fit for it. He has the mind. He has the quickness, the explosion to keep up with those slot wide receivers. But Emmanuel Forbes, the first-round pick, was also used at slot with Kendall Fuller and Benjamin St. Juice on the outside. Talk to me about Emmanuel Forbes. Do you think he can play slot? And how do you think that shapes out? Yeah, I absolutely think he can. I think it starts with his length, and I think it starts with that 4-3 speed. I think we talk about corners all the time. Teams want to run that seam. And if you're even, you're leaving. Well, Emmanuel can run 4-3 and elongate that stride. So you're not going to leave him running up the seam. And then, of course, he can turn that head. And we know the ball instincts and the ball hawk that he can be um, up the middle of the field or whether he's playing at the boundary or he's playing that half turn with the sideline to his back. So he just does so many things well to where if you want to play him in the slot, you want to play on the outside, I'm just overall excited to see where Emmanuel ultimately slots because he can do a lot of different things against a different, all different types of skill sets of receivers. You look in the SEC, whether he's facing a bigger X receiver at 6'2", 195 pounds, or a smaller receiver in the slot that has that twitchy, they run whip routes or run quick timing routes. He just does such a good job in man and zone. And then, of course, you add the instincts into it to where 
I'm just so excited to see him get on the football field and start playing and start cracking pads, really, because he's 165 pounds, guys, but he is not afraid to stick his nose in the mud. Yeah, we heard that from Randy Jordan at practice saying, you know, I'd love to see you come up and pop Brian Robinson when the pads come on. And obviously that kind of play, I don't think Emmanuel Forbes would be so willing to go up high for that one. <laughs> right. But let's flip yeah. it to the other side of the football. Um, Eric Bieniemy has been calling, obviously, as the OC assistant head coach, he has taken this team by the horns. Logan Paulson told us last week that like 90% of the plays that have been run have been pass plays. What that says to me is that they know what the weakness is of this offensive line. Like They were 12th in the league in rushing yards last season. They kind of know that the offensive line is big issue is pass protection. What are your feelings about that uh, being 90% pass play so far in OTAs? Yeah, I'm absolutely fine with it. I think that's something as far as these install portions of the offseason, as far as look at this offensive line, guys, I'm sure you were there as well as far as I have questions with this front five. I know they cut Andrew Norwell, left guard, left tackle. I mean, we know your young rookie quarterback, really red shirt season for Sam Howell, if you will. Best way to allow him to reach that performance ceiling is to stay upright. But I think there's going to be a lot of timing routes, a lot of quick hitters, a lot of screens. I know they've been doing some in OTAs, a lot of things in the backfield for some guys, allowing Sam to even RPOs, QB powers, QB reads, QB draws, which we saw him do at Carolina even in the Dallas game, or even some of the preseason that we saw last year. I know it's a small sample size, but you look at the offensive line, there is concerns there. You have big bodies in the backfield, but they're not super wiggly. They're not guys that are going to have these elite bursts to break through holes, create their own alleys, find these back these backside cut lanes and try to hit them with the one foot in the ground and then north-south. I don't see it. We don't have a ton of that, ton of juice, if you will. I like B-Rob. I like Antonio Gibson. I like the guys in the building. But we don't have that elite burst guy to find these small alleys that Sam Cosme or whether it's a Ricky Schaumburg or Nick Gates or City Charles to find these lanes. So you might have to sling the ball around a little bit. And by doing that, you're going to have to get Sam Powell in rhythm. And by doing that, it's going to be quick game, timing, screen. So I'm absolutely fine with slinging the rock around a little bit. You're going to have to at some point because we've proven we can run the ball. But at some point, you also have to prove you have to throw the ball as well. So I'm all for it. Right. Yeah. And it's just new age NFL, man. Passing the ball is so much more intricate. Yeah. It seems like a lot of running plays are just kind of you've know, you've been doing this since middle school, guys. You, you kind of know you kind of know where you're and going. And also with this. when you're in shells without pads, really. Right. No what, a, to run what can you do? You know? right. right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but KJ Henry, he's somebody who I've been very interested in, uh, especially with Chase Young, of course, not not being at OTAs. What are your thoughts on KJ Henry? Do you feel he can contribute? And what did you like about him coming out? Yeah. So for me, guys, he is edge three on this roster okay. for me. I really do think he can challenge Chase Young and Montez Sweat, specifically because that Clemson front seven was extremely hit. Him along that front seven was overlooked. All the names, Brian Brzee, even go all, on and on. Even two guys this year, Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter, at linebacker, they're yeah. probably going to be drafted high. He was right. just overlooked. Right. Look at, look at, yeah. His talent, like when you watch him, when I watch him on film, it almost is like they weren't using him as that edge rusher. Like they would swap him with that multi right. front. It would take him out of that element. Am I cr wrong for thinking that? No, you're absolutely correct. And he even sometimes, I think you look at Drew Sanders and what he did at Arkansas. Now, not from a coverage ability perspective, but even a better example would be Melvin Ingram, that spinner. Okay. Right. That they play a lot of the Chargers defense plays. And even what he did some for the Chiefs, as far as the KJ, whether you play inside, play outside, drop into the flats. I want KJ to get after the passer because you never have enough guys that can push the pocket. And what it makes me so impressed about KJ is a lot of these guys that come into the league, Chase Young, for example, they consistently want to press the outside shoulder of the tackle. They don't want to win with leverage in the inside or, or shock the breastplate of an offensive lineman or win to the inside. KJ can do that. And then he can also chase guys down in the flat of a defense, not as well as Montez. Or Chase Young. He doesn't have that athletic profile. There's a reason why he slipped into day three. He does have some minor deficiencies in his game. But overall, ACC experience, power fives, a heck of a young man. I loved watching him at the Senior Bowl. I really expect him to push for a hefty amount of snaps this year because William Bradley King, James Smith-Williams, there's, there's some depth on this roster. Obata, Tuhill. I'm not hating on those guys at all, but you got to get fresh legs in the building to be able to push these guys like Chase and Montez because who the hell knows if either of those guys will be back this time next year. Absolutely. And uh, recently, Terry McLaurin spoke with Julie Donaldson for the Washington uh, Command Center, and he had made a comment saying that Sam Howell's come in, kind of grabbed this offense by the horns. So my question to you, Ryan, Terry McLaurin, his likelihood this season, what's more likely? He's going to have a worse statistical year, the same or better? I think it's going to be better. I really do. I think it's sometimes even these last few years – We'd watch games that would take the third quarter for Terry to get a right. target or two. And I know it 
teed off a lot of people. 17 is too talented not to get the football. You got to feed your best athletes. And I know Terry will take the political route because he is that type of man, that type of leader to say, you know, I'm, I'm happy to feed everybody else, but you got that type of talent where he can beat every single corner in football. And I fully believe that, especially one-on-one, he's going to get a ton of attention. We know that, but I, I fully expect Terry to have an outstanding year and really finally to get the respect that he deserves from the rest of the league, because I know we haven't had a ton of big time athletes in the burgundy goal that haven't gotten their attention. He deserves it as one of the premier receivers in this league. I think he's going to be an absolute stud in 2023 moving forward. And I saw Deuce had said in our group chat in the spaces that he saw Terry McLaurin motioning in and actually getting a matchup on a linebacker at OTAs, which obviously sprung a huge gain. That's not something we saw last year, Ryan. Right, exactly. Right. Imagine him on a cross. I mean, we saw it against Dallas. Right. Right. Sam Howell's yeah. first pass across and get 17 in space. It's super simple sometimes. Really doesn't have to be complicated. I mean, you look at the Chiefs offense. Some of the times it's simple timing routes, quick hitters, crosses over the middle of the field. Third and six, we're going to run five yards. Travis Kelsey going to turn around. The old Jason Witten just fall forward. First down. 17 on a crosser. Good luck catching him. Same thing with Jahan Dotson. So sometimes it really isn't that complicated. It's just execution and timing with the guys in the building. I think we have the weapons to, to definitely score more than 18.9 points per game this year, guys. Right. Yeah. And another <clears throat> position that a lot of people consider a weakness, uh, I think Eric Bieniemy has been speaking glowingly of him has been the tight ends. Who do you think emerges from this tight end group? Yeah, guys, I want to be positive about the tight end. <laughs> I really do. Um, but I'm not going to click. I'm not going to hit the panic button just because of Antonio Gibson. And I really do expect that. I know it's been talked about a little bit in OTAs as far as how he's been utilized in space. 225 pounds. The guy was at Memphis. He was a receiver at Memphis. Yeah. He was not a running back. But with Armani Rogers, he was the best tight end athletically in that room. I need to see more from John Bates. He's strictly a Y blocker right now. Cole Turner, I get it. You're at Nevada. You're head topping people. You're going over the top. I get it. But the NFL is different than the Mountain West. Last year, missed time because of a concussion. I did not see you separate at Nevada at the Senior Bowl, first year of your career. I need to see that over the middle portions of the field to where we know Sam Howell needs those sure set of hands. Logan Thomas, we talk about him potentially being a cap casualty. Conversations I had were along those lines. Well, with Armani Rogers gone, probably, probably going to be here and probably have a hefty role. Last year, we expected him to be a potential, what, top 13, maybe 14 tight end in the league because we knew how Carson Wentz utilized tight ends. Right. We didn't see it. I need to be proved. I hope this group makes me put my foot in my mouth in these coming months because we have to have better play from tight ends, both as a Y and F using in space. But whether it's Logan and AG or John Cole, whoever it is, I don't care who it is. I don't care if us three are the tight ends this year. Mm -hmm. We need better from this group moving into 2023 because it's going to be so important for the entire architecture of the offense and for Sam Howell to get in a rhythm early in games. Absolutely. Now to wrap this up, Ryan, I only have a couple more questions for you. First one being, what is your prediction for the wide receiver depth chart? Um, Kaz Allen, Kazmir Allen, the wide receiver that was an undrafted free agent that they actually signed to a pretty good deal as an undrafted free agent to come here to Washington has been out with injury the past couple of days. And Dax Milne has made some toe taps, some great catches out there. So give us your prediction for who's going to be the, the wide receivers on the depth chart with the 53. Yeah, I think we know we're at the top. Terry, Jahan, Curtis. I do think Marcus Kemp also makes the roster. You know, Eric's not going to bring him over to not make it unless he doesn't. Unless he doesn't showcase well in training camp, then, then let him go. Um, but I do think Dax wins, makes the roster. I am just – it comes down to – I mean, I, I do think Diami as well. I can't forget about Diami Brown. I just need to see more from him. Um, but, but between – I'll even look at Kaz and Mitchell Tinsley. I like Mitchell Tinsley a lot. I, I know I've talked to you guys about him. But Kazmir Allen has a certain juice to his game when healthy that he doesn't grow on trees. And he's got the Power 5 experience at UCLA. And we just have not had a field flipper in such a long time in Washington really since Brandon Banks. And I'm, I do not want to see Niles Paul, that type of body, back there return kicks <laughs> or Antonio Gibson again. I don't want to see it. I want to see someone with some legit juice and vision to potentially flip the field for you. So all those guys I mentioned, Diami, Terry, Curtis, Jahan, and then I, and, and Dax, I do think will make it. And then I will say that Kaz makes it and Mitchell goes to the practice squad as of now. Mm, I would okay. like that. That's a really healthy group, to be yeah. honest, Ryan. Um, next one I have for you. Let's talk about Jamin Davis. Currently, he got surgery. Coach Rivera did not seem overly concerned about the surgery. But this is a big year for Jamin Davis. He stayed healthy for two straight years. And now being next to Cody Barton, he's going to be asked to do a lot more than in years past. What are your expectations for Jamin Davis heading into year three? 
Yeah, hopefully we can see those same improvements that we saw under sophomore year and now the junior year. Um, haven't seen that athleticism that he showed to the famous Florida Kentucky game carrying Kyle Pitts down the seam. Hmm. Have not seen that yet. But look, it's year three, bottom line. And we know that what I love about Martin Mayhew and Ron Rivera is are constantly getting guys in the building to compete. Khalid Hudson, is he going to have a role or not at the second level of this defense? Because coming out of Michigan, he played the jack spot in that Wolverines defense, the same that Dax Hill did. Completely different body types, but it kind of gives you a gist of what he can do both against the run and in coverage. And we know Cody Barton, what he can do when he filled in for KJ Wright last year in Seattle. It's a heck of a ball player. And I'm really excited to see him progress because I'll take Cody Barton over Cole Holcomb every single day of the week. Not hating on Cole Holcomb, but I like the upgrades that they made. But for Jamin Davis, slowly improving game after game after game, just like he did last year, slowing the thing down. Linebacker position is slow till you know. I don't want to see him hit a hole, and it's out the back gate, and I'm seeing 52 on the all-22, chasing bodies again down the sideline. I'm excited for him. I want him to get back to full 100% because this is, as it is for a lot of guys, but these year three guys, him, Sam Cosme, St. Juiced, absolutely huge seasons for all those guys. Absolutely. And the last one I have for you, Ryan, uh, kind of tricky way I'm going to put this, but is it a good thing that we haven't heard much about Curtis Samuel through these OTAs? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It feels like 2021 was five years right. ago when we didn't see right. him at all yeah. um, and had a heck of a 2022. But I think he's such a nice chess piece for this offense with the enemy. I really am excited to see Curtis in this offense. So really even goes back to what Casimir Allen could be right. if there were injuries, knock on wood, as far as those similar skill sets. Um, I don't think Kaz is the a receiver that Curtis is as far as a yak guy and really toughness in space just yet. But I'm, I'm right there with you, Kyle. Absolutely. I don't want to hear Curtis Samuel's name until we show up in week one and he's torching the Arizona young secondary. I can't wait. Absolutely. Cannot wait. And hopefully he's not the only guy that's being used in motion um, on every single play. <laughs> Brian, right. I can't thank you enough, brother, for taking some time out, being able to join us and giving us your intellect and spreading your knowledge all throughout the Washington community. Before you get out of here, would you like to plug your social media handle and your podcast just in case anybody watching hasn't followed you yet and would like to? Yeah, absolutely. Twitter underscore Ryan Fowler. I'm at the draftnetwork.com, audio, written content as well. And then I have Commanding the Huddle. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, one episode a week right now in the off season, and then two per week once we hit uh, the ball in September. Absolutely. And make sure you guys go check it out. It's a great podcast. Yeah. Really is Fowler. Can't thank you enough, brother. Have a good weekend. Thank Absolutely. you, man. Thank you so much, guys. Of course. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us, Ryan. Now, we are joined. We are going to be joined by Trevor Sikama yet next, but I loved to hear what he had to say about Curtis Samuel because like just watching Curtis Samuel's press conference the other day, if you go back and watch it, just pay attention to the mannerisms, the energy that Curtis Samuel is kind of exuberating like you look at it and you'll notice that he's excited dude and i don't think it's just because of eb i think with his right. body type and everything i think he is like feeling really good yeah and i mean being two years removed from missing that injury he's right i mean brian is completely right like it seems like that was so long ago like just last offseason there were questions about like will curtis samuel be healthy is he already a bus signing and then last year right. just hit the threat of everything that he can do changes the offense and it's so nice to have yeah because Curtis Samuel is one of the weapons that was used against Rivera when people were calling for his job two seasons ago, saying, oh, you yeah. signed Curtis Samuel, give him all that money, he hasn't done anything. Right. He was very crucial last season. But before yeah. we are joined by our next guest from Pro Football Focus, I want to answer some fan questions here, Mike. And this one is from the Colonel. He Just asked, call me Mike? Yeah, I did. I, that was weird. Calls I don't me know. that these days. I know, nobody. Yeah. Any <laughs> is there anything to the rumors that Cameron Dantzler had some off-the-field issues and was released? Or is it because Forbes and Martin are doing so on OTAs, he became expendable? I think my theory on that is he was signed in case they couldn't draft Emmanuel Forbes, in case somebody did take him and they had to go a different route early on. They wanted to have somebody in there. Uh, so I think that's why he was signed to me because it's such a log jam. If you know you're going to draft a corner in round one, why even take that risk and, and waste any money? But it does suck because I do like Cameron Dantzler. I was excited to kind of see if he could kind of become what he was supposed to be when he was coming out uh, in the draft and continue – going um but yeah i mean i think it was just a numbers game and they realized like we got a log jam emmanuel forbes has surpassed expectations for what a lot of people were thinking so I, I think that was kind of it but hey you know i'm not conspiracy brained like kyle you know so. yeah uh, but you know colonel that i am a uh, conspiracy brained i don't think it was because of what they did in like forbes and martin what they did in otas i don't believe that at all 
I think this a lot of it has to do with how many guys they did bring in because we talk about they still have Kendall Fuller on the roster at the moment and they have Benjamin St. Juice on the other side. So it doesn't make it doesn't make sense for them to have this many guys here. And with Cam Dancer, when I watched him in college, the one thing I noticed was he was more as a, like a blitzer, being close to the line of scrimmage and going in, down the line of scrimmage. He wasn't more so a cover guy. Going to get Emmanuel Forbes, Quan Martin, who can cover guys, along with Benjamin St. Juice and Kendall Fuller, that you were already set up. And like if you bring in Cam Dancer, that's going against what they can do. And so you're almost adding a, a cog that doesn't fit here. And it would make sense as to why they say, look, wait, we have plenty of depth. We love Danny Johnson. D uh, Wild Goose is looking really good. D D Reeves is there as well. We t typically we're, we, we're comfortable with where we're at, and I can understand that. I don't think it's just because of how well they did in OTAs. I think it's how well they built the team in the offseason kind of surprised them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was also surprised that uh, some, I forget who it was. I think it was probably Redskins ran, Burgundy ran, whatever, whatever it is, uh, another constantly negative dude was talking about how he doesn't think that the roster is as – or he says that the roster talent is just about as good as when Rivera signed it. I just don't see how you can even think that. Wait, before he got here? Yeah. Are you serious? I swear to God. Uh, yeah. That's a really weird comment. I don't even want to talk about it. it right? Like, what an odd thing to yeah, say. Like, it's just not true. It's just, no. to be quite frank. Now, let's yeah. go to our next question. This is submitted through Twitter from our guy, UK Commanders, Alid. Appreciate you, Alid. He, he worked really hard to get this question to me, and I appreciate it. It's been said that EB is trying to get the best out of the players on the practice field with hard-nosed coaching. B-Rob, I'm hearing, was having some difficulty lining up correctly, where to stand, etc. Do you think Randy Jordan would find this invading on his coaching, or as EB is trying to implement his style, he would be okay with this? Yeah, I would I would think he would be okay with this. Randy Jordan's a very well-respected coach. He knows how it works. He's been in the league for a very long time. Uh, he's a former running back himself. So I, I I do think that he understands like EB's implementing his offense and really until he can kind of he can grab hold of it himself because he's learning a new offense too. He's got to learn a new playbook and, and new stuff. Then I think he'd probably be okay with, with EB going in there and being like, look, this is how I want it done. And then he'll just kind of take notes of that and do that from there on out. So I think he would be okay with it. I would hope as a professional being paid that much, I would hope he wouldn't be offended with a, his boss being like, this is how you do it, you know? Well, yeah, and, and that being said, even It is if, a good question, though. But... It's a great question because even if Randy Jordan did have a problem with it, Alad, what's the first thing Eric Bieniemy is going to say to Randy Jordan? Well, you're his running back coach, yeah, and he's not lining up correctly. Why is That's on you. So yeah. either I'm yelling at him or I'm yelling at you. So what do you want? I'm doing your job for you. And if you keep pr pressing that on me, I'm going to keep making it known that I'm fixing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's it. I don't think Randy Jordan would have an issue with it. I think that he kind of understands who Eric Bieniemy is. I mean, Eric Bieniemy coached Adrian Peterson. He knows what the system, what the position needs to be successful. And I think that Brian Robinson should be listening to Eric Bieniemy talking about the running back position more so than anything else. And no disrespect to Coach King or Coach Jordan, I'm just saying Eric Bieniemy knows how to get the talent out of that guy. I and mean, it's been proven time and time again, in my personal right. opinion. Now, let's move to our next question. Let's go to the Discord chat. We're going to be joined by our, our next guest very soon. We're just flying through these fan questions, brother. Um, I'm really worried about Hall, by the way. I hope he's all right. Now, this next question is from Orange Guys Crush. Get sick. You know? 92. From, and he asks, Brian Robinson Jr. only got 12 targets total last year. AG got 58 targets, five more than McKissick got on the previous year. Do you think Brian Robinson will be featured more through the air next season, or do you think he sticks to the ground? Um, I think when you look at Brian Robinson, I think you get in the it sounds like you got the January six boys, the dogs all fired up up there. You know, what'd you do? Turn on a Trump speech? They're Stop, up there man. getting on somebody uh, rang a doorbell. <laughs> I, I think Brian Robinson, like if you really look at his value, Brian Robinson was I mean, I I'm pretty sure we heard it from uh Fowler last year. Brian Robinson might have him and Damian Pierce are probably two of the best pass blocking running backs in that draft. So I think you will see him, I mean, on occasion, catch some passes, but I would imagine it would probably be around the same. I mean, that's more Antonio Gibson's role. If you have Brian Robinson in there, I think you want him back there pass blocking. So it's funny, OC, because like people had talked about, you know, Brian Robinson, they don't see him as a pass catching back. But let's go back to that highlight touchdown he had last he can't, season right, where yeah. he runs over a dude. And that's the kind of situation you want Brian Robinson catching the footballs in. So I don't think it's more so of like having to force Brian Robinson and getting into those passing situations. I think it's more so catering to the fact of can we get that matchup of him being one-on-one -on -one with a DB on the flat in the outside and executing that 
more so than just like let's try to get him the ball more and more and more. Right. Um, With- I I think that he is structured to run the the ball on the ground strictly, but his pass blocking ability and his pass catching what we've seen running downhill, I think that it would be stupid not to give him at least a little bit more targets and utilize his size and uh, speed. Right, yeah, with with him, which, I mean, you're, I think you're 100% right. It's quality targets over quantity of targets. With Antonio Gibson, it's almost the opposite because you want, dog, what are you doing? Yeah, because you want AG to be able to get the ball in space and use his ability there. Um, because that's such, it was backwards last season, to be perfectly honest with you, with just how everything went out because it didn't make sense. With the way AG was used, we saw in the Jaguars game how much of a productive piece he was when he was using the passing game. Then it was used again. It was the craziest thing. And, like, the high, the biggest highlights from AG's career have come from passing plays. The big screen against Buffalo from two seasons ago. The next one was last season when that catch he had against the Jaguars, which was just a beautiful executed play. And we just don't see it again. I, I don't. Right. I, it doesn't make sense to me what happened last season. I, nothing does, to be perfectly honest with you, but it is what it is. Now let's move on to this next question from Tim Towner. Reed. I heard several players reference the new play calls are decidedly longer, and Logan even says it's like learning a new language. So my question is, can you speak more than one language? Did you take a foreign language in school? If so, which ones? Give us an example. Dude, I was such a goddamn idiot in school. There, I, I took Spanish <laughs> for like a month, and the teacher was like, you're not really cut out for this. Let's put you in some tech classes. <laughs> and I was like, sick. Awesome. But uh, can no, you imagine speak- trying to teach a high school read in Spanish? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, you know. The only language I speak is Downs. That's it. Oh, I no. speak that well because my brother, I speak well with him. I can understand it, you know. So uh, that is kind of my love language, I guess you would say. Yeah, and Reed's brother, is his nickname is Beezer. So if you ever hear that name, Nate, you know Beezer's who he's talking man. about. He is, yeah. he is the man, dude. Um, I wouldn't say I speak more than one language. I, I can talk Spanish with people, you know, and I can make um, Spanish people laugh for the most part. I know all the cuss words and everything like that. <laughs> I took Spanish in high school. I'll never forget when um, in high school, they like they told you to pick a Spanish nickname. And of course, I had to go with Pablo. You know what I'm That's saying? That's sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sick, sick. Dude. Um, and then I had I took French like you for like a month. And then yeah. I, I just went to somebody. I was like, dude, I can't do it. Yeah, I just can't. It's quite simply, I just can't. I could have kept, yeah, I could have kept going in Spanish, but I was like, nah. But the Spanish guys at work used to call me El Tigre. That was cool. Because, like, imagine cool. just being called the Tiger. Right. And then the other okay. one is obviously sign language. Um, Like, my grandmother is deaf. She's been oh, deaf, yeah, that's right. deaf my, right. my whole life. Like, I can have a conversation with her without even signing. You know, I'm able to be able to do that. I'm not good. I can't sign with a deaf person on the street without a doubt. Like, I can help if it's a situation where they're trying to order food at a fast food restaurant and there's, right. like, a disconnect. I can help with things like that. Uh, Cause yeah. I can understand, but it's not like I could, I'm not like my little brother who can sit there and go and just run right. it off yeah. for you. you yeah. know what I'm Throwing saying? up gang signs and stuff. That's well, what it looks like. Dude, it's crazy I used to, him and my mom going back and forth. Yeah. I learned it too when my little brother was young. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Trevor, S- Trevor, 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 sick him up. <laughs> what? What's up, Trevor? What's good, Trevor? Only, only my Sam closest Hal. friends call me Trevor. So <laughs> that's uh, that tells you the kind of company that I'm with, and I enjoy it. But, guys, it's great to be back with you again. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I apologize for that, Trevor. I don't know what that was, but we don't need to revisit that. Basically, he was just like, you're not my friend enough to call me Trevor. <laughs> no, I <laughs> <laughs> Not That's at all, brother. man. Not at all. <laughs> my Trevor, I can't thank you enough for joining us, brother. Um, my first question I have for you, we, we talked about this Ryan Fowler earlier, but EB, it looks like Eric Bieniemy has brought a mic and has Sam Hell mic'd up for the huddle. And being able to hear his play calls, make sure they're coming out coherently, that everyone is getting in the right position. What do you think of that move? Is that something you've heard before? Because I think that is a great thing to have for a young quarterback. No, I guess I, I, I haven't thought of that before. And now that I hear it, it's like, oh, okay, you know, like the technology exists. This is kind of something that I feel like right. maybe should be a little bit more popular. Maybe it is more popular, but I love it, man. Anything that could help smooth out any sort of communication is key, right? I mean, anybody who's been in any sort of relationship, whether it's romantic friendship with your parents, your siblings, or you're a quarterback and your offensive coordinator, you know that communication is key. And so anything that can eliminate those roadblocks is going to be good. Like it's going to help you get to that final answer of what is Sam Howell going to be for Washington? 
that's what path you're trying to be on. You're trying to be in the fast lane for that. And I, I, I love that move. I, I love be, them kind of implementing that and really figuring out where Sam is at at a baseline level and where to go from there. Yeah. I mean, dude, LSU has air conditioned helmets right now. Like they can, if they want to oh. put a mic in there so they can hear them, they, they can do that. I don't no, know if that's a no, thing. no. Kids, kids are getting soft. We, we can't, know, we, right? we can't, we can't be doing that. You go to LSU to practice in the in the sweltering heat, man. You right. can't be putting air conditioning in their helmets. You got to no. let them sweat down there. Yeah, yeah LSU thinking... has air conditioning in their helmets. Imagine what the Jets are doing for Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, they they make it like one of those float tanks when he's right. in there. <laughs> Just. Uh, but you're a Bucks fan. You're a notorious Buccaneers fan. I saw some clips. Everybody's trying to clown on Baker. What's going on with Baker? Do you have faith in him? <laughs> so, like, obviously the the training camp clips or the OTA clips, which I can't remember where we are. OTAs, mini yeah, OTAs, right. voluntary OTA. I don't remember where we are right now. But the first reps of Baker Mayfield were never going to look great. I mean, right. Baker is always been a gamer type of a quarterback anyways like i don't think you've ever heard a baker mayfield report where somebody goes wow he looked perfect in practice no baker even going back to oklahoma has always been the player who is like okay sunday rolls around big lights are on it's time for the game and he shows up that's when we've seen him at his best so the practice clips of him struggling with accuracy doesn't really shock me one just because that feels like how baker is Uh, two it is a new receiver group he's still trying to get uh things together with them but look i my 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 Bucks fan people are coming after me right now because I just don't have a lot of faith in what the Buccaneers season is going to be. I mean, they finished in a really disappointing fashion last year, and that was with Brady as their quarterback. Right. What do you tell me? It's going to be an upgrade like it should be an automatic upgrade going to Baker Mayfield? No, you probably got to see a little bit more to believe that. And so from a surface level of things going into the season. I am kind of skeptical about what's going on in Tampa just because there is a ton of new. The secondary depth isn't as deep as it's been the last couple of years. It's a lot of new pieces along the offensive line playing new spots for the first time. We know how important that is. Sure, the receivers are still going to be great, but they're still figuring things out on their defensive front as well. So there's a lot of moving parts in Tampa Bay to just say, oh, yeah, yeah, this team will be totally fine. So I do have my concerns, including uh, what's going to happen at quarterback. Right. Plus, it's one of those things where every year, there's like a quarterback where or every few years, I guess, where like no matter what they do, it, it used to be Mitch Trubisky. Granted, Baker's better than Mitch Trubisky, but if they miss any pass, it automatically becomes a meme. It's just right. like, what Blake are you doing? Bortles. Yeah, yes. Blake Bortles. Yeah, everybody just loves the clown on him. And I think Baker's filling that role. Nope. Yeah, you are. He is yeah. giving us the offseason content. Everybody's got a job right. every single offseason for viral yeah. clips because we've got to talk about something. And uh, unfortunately, that Baker's drew on, drew on the short end of the stick there with those yeah. highlights. Yeah, I'm sure Kyle Trask is very thankful for that. Uh, now, Trevor, I want to talk about this Washington offense in particular because we talked about EB do having Sam Howell mic'd up in the huddle. But from a national perspective, Trevor, what do you think EB elevates this offense? Because last season, that was the big concern with this football team, was being able to score enough points to win football games. The top five, de- top ten defense, they're very, very good. What do you? How much of an elevation is adding Eric Bieniemy to this coaching staff? I think it should be huge. I, I really do. I don't think this can be downplayed of, of what kind of an impact the enemy is going to have on the offense. And something that I like about him in particular is – You think about Patrick Mahomes, and I'm about to draw some stylistic comparisons between Patrick Mahomes and Sam Howell. So nobody out there quote tweet me and just take the part where I'm saying that Sam Howell is Patrick Mahomes. But stylistically, from where Eric Biennemi is coming from, I do like the skill set that Sam Howell presents because – I I know that you guys have talked about this plenty of times on your show. There's a lot of people who cover the commanders who say the same thing. You go back throughout Sam Howell's college career and those first two seasons, that freshman and sophomore season, man, he was slinging it. I mean, he was a true gunslinger and he was a passer first. That that third season, that junior season, he didn't have those passing weapons. They didn't have those guys to dump the ball off to. It was him. And because of that, he became a major running part of that offense. And the reason why I bring up Mahomes is because I wouldn't say that like Mahomes is this certified dual threat quarterback but he's certainly somebody who if you don't keep an eye on him he'll tuck the ball and run and can pick up a couple of yards and those can be the things that can they can get you in manageable second and third down situations you can pick up different first downs and I don't think we're going to get full junior year Sam Howell he's going to be this like battering ram kind Mm -hmm. of a kind of a quarterback back there like I don't think he's going to be this Taysom Hill type of quarterback 
But I do think that the success he had on the ground that junior year does lend itself to the enemy kind of saying, hey, this is, I mean, Mahomes obviously is special in so many different ways, but Mahomes was able to open up so much space because of those times where defenses had to respect what he's able to do with his legs as well. And I feel like a little bit of that could be sprinkled into how they're approaching what the best version of Sam Howell could be for this offense. So that that's kind of how I look at Eric Bieniemy, and we'll see how he's going to utilize a really nice young wide receiver core there, including Terry McLaurin and obviously high hopes for John Dotson as well, coming up as the wide receiver two on this team. So I think that will be to be seen how he's going to utilize those guys, but specifically with how I like where he's coming from with Mahomes because some of those elements could still exist with run versus pass. Right. And I mean, you just mentioned him, Jahan Dotson. Last year was a very interesting wide receiver class. There's a lot of good guys. I mean, you look at Alave, Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Jahan Dotson. Where would you rank Jahan Dotson amongst the second year wide receivers? Man, I mean, so many of them all played so well, Dude, right? I mean, like crazy. Garrett Wilson was incredible. Drake, Drake London for what you wanted him to be, I think was perfect for, for Atlanta's offense, being a big guy who's a contested catch player, uh, right. like a slant guy over the middle, everything. Chris Olave proved himself to be very well-rounded and a great deep threat. George Pickens turned out to be this all-around yeah. wide receiver who um, I'll just say I was uh, very high on and I had him in my top five wide receivers going into the draft. <laughs> I'm just saying, just toot my own, own horn a little bit because I got to do it a little bit. But <laughs> Jahan Dotson, I had kind of right outside. And, and that's not to say like I didn't think that he was the caliber of those players. I just didn't know exactly what he was going to be coming from yeah. that limited Penn State offense. Where a lot of offense. people had him ranked too. Yeah, so exactly. Just, going yeah. into the NFL. So I really do feel like he has just as much of a say in putting himself with all of those names, right? When you bring up, oh, what an incredible wide receiver class it is. There's not a lot of people who bring up Jahan Dotson's name with Olave and London right. and Garrett Wilson. But Who's to say that this upcoming year, a fully healthy season from him, we are not then doing that this upcoming year when we rattle off all those good wide receivers. I certainly think that is in the cards for him, even with as great as those other wide receivers were able to play. Yeah, awesome. As long as he's over Traylon Burks, I'm fine with that. <laughs> and, I Yeah, I would I would have him over Traylon Burks, yes. Okay, all right, good. And I also think it would help with Jahan Dotson, just like Terry McLaurin throughout his career, once he has consistency at quarterback, we will feel a lot better and be able to see him at his full um, potential. My next question for you, Washington's defense, they added Quan Martin in the second round. They went mm -hmm. and got Emmanuel Forbes in the first round. They have Chase Young returning from injury, and then Montez Sweat obviously coming on a contract year. This was the number one defense on third down last year, Trevor. They were top 10, very good unit. Can Washington's defense be better this year? Yeah, I mean, certainly – Man, I didn't know they were number one on third down. That's awesome. I mean, like, it's a stacked group. When you look at Washington's defense, you know that they've got the ability to play. They've got starters at every single position, and they even have a good amount of depth that you got to feel great about, especially with the young guys that they drafted in the secondary. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a decent rotation. But certainly, I think that it can maintain, at least I will say, their top 10 status. It's really hard to predict what defenses are going to yeah. do because it's so up and down every single year. It's such a chemistry defined side of the ball where all all facets of it have to really be working out like on offense if you've got a really good run blocking offensive line you got a good running back behind you like that can be your identity you can get by that way defense it's really hard to succeed if all 11 players and you even bring some depth guys so you'd say probably your top 15 defensive players aren't all playing well together so the cohesiveness the chemistry that definitely goes into it but you had two really good players in the secondary Forbes Look, I, I was worried about him pre-draft because I'm worried about the weight, right? It's not like he's just skinny. He's like unprecedentedly small. That yeah, that, like that body weight yeah. that he has, no corner in the NFL weighs as little as Emmanuel Forbes does. But dude's a hell of a player. And he's somebody who, it's, it's not like when you watch him, you go, man, that weight shows up in a lot of different ways. He's tough. He's competitive. He'll try to help and run support. Like all that stuff is there. So even if you pack on like five pounds, even that just could be a major difference for him. Now, I believe he entered Mississippi state weighing like 160. And so for him to only be like 165 by the time his career was up there, probably just tells you this dude's metabolism about as fast as it gets. And maybe he just yeah. doesn't going to, he's right. not going to put on body weight, but must be nice. Hell, yeah. I wish we could have that problem, but 
hell of a player on the ball, right? Former wide receiver. He's there to create turnovers. Quan Martin's a guy who could play in the slot, but he's also one of the few safeties in this past class that gives you free safety athleticism. A lot of other safeties, they were just strong safety types. They weren't going to be able to play that center fielder single high coverage to free up guys like Cam Curl, right? And I think that that's why these are two fantastic picks for them. And so, Big time years for the edge guys in Montez Sweat and Chase Young. They got to continue to get after it. They got to play like, well, their second contract's on the line because yeah. it is. And if that happens, I do think the ball will get in those corners and in those secondary players' hands enough to where this team can ex- absolutely be another top 10 defense. Right. And all right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Don't feel bad. You don't have to pick the commanders for this, but one surprise team from the NFC and one surprise team from the AFC. Hey Trevor, let me make sure I'm not let me make sure I'm not forgetting anybody because okay. I'm gonna get yelled at if I do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, a surprise team? Are you saying like to make the playoffs? Yeah, or... yeah, just a team that's gonna exceed expectations. It's a good question. In the NFC, I think the Atlanta Falcons are the team that I point to. Okay, a lot that that can genuinely win that division. Yep. They, like they I really a... do. I I I, I had Desmond Ritter as my QB one in the class two years ago no way so yeah yeah i, I had him too yeah. i had i had Ritter as my qb1 um and yeah obviously like i didn't love the guys who were in that class right, but right. ritter showed at least really high level processing the body type the arm strength to be able to push it down the field and i think this next year is going to be even better for him so i think they're going to get kyle pitts involved even more i think drake london obviously establishing what his role is there you're adding Bijan Robinson to that group. You added Matthew Bergeron to an offensive line that already had a lot of ass kickers on it. Yeah. So you know that's going to continue to be a strength for them. Ton of new additions on the defensive side yeah. of the ball, which was their big Achilles heel last year. And the NFC South's up for grabs. When you look at Atlanta, if you go off of projected win totals for this upcoming season, Atlanta has the easiest schedule in the NFL. So mm-hmm. I think that you've got an upward swing on offense. You've certainly got an upward swing on defense. You get an easy schedule. I think the Atlanta Falcons could definitely be a team that not a lot of people are talking about that could make the playoffs that uh, certainly could. And then AFC, it's an AFC team that I think. <sighs> okay. So I think my two answers here would be, either the Indianapolis Colts or the Cleveland Browns. And that's because both of these teams last year were projected to either win their division or contend for a playoff spot. Right. Obviously Cleveland was a disaster with what happened with Deshaun Watson and everything that went on with Deshaun Watson goes into why that team did not perform well. I fully believe that that was a major distraction for this team that they were not able to get right. If they get a more stable environment there, that is one of the more complete rosters in the NFL. It has been for the last couple of years. They just haven't been able to turn it into a playoff run. And if Watson is better, then I think that they will be certainly a team that contend for maybe even that division um, because that roster is that good. And then the Colts, I think everybody's forgetting about the Colts, man. Last right. year, they were projected to win the division easily, really yeah. easily. And, the, and people thought the Titans were going to re- regress. They absolutely did. It was just catastrophic what happened with the Colts and their offensive line. But you think the offensive line is probably going to have a bounce back. Anthony Richardson and what Shane Steichen might be able to do there with him being the new head coach, what he was able to do with Jalen Hurts. Can that slingshot a really solid rookie season? Because the rest of the roster is there for him. Mm -hmm. I like the Jags. I like where they're going. The Jags should probably still be the favorites to win that division. But I think it's close. I really do think that you can't just right off Indianapolis now. Like, oh, they're no longer a team that we have to talk about. They're a team that I do think has playoff aspirations. Back to the Falcons. Them adding Bajon Robinson is just insane. They already had such a good running game last year. Like They they dominated us. Arthur Smith having Derrick Henry in Tennessee. I mean, this is literally getting the the younger version kind of in a way. So they can run the ball through it, and then Desmond Ritter doesn't have to do that much. It's a great situation for Ritter. I I absolutely love that Sikama picked the Falcons. Um, Now, to wrap this up, Sikama, I'm going to put you on the spot, brother, because I I got a a bone to pick. Is Terry McLaurin a top-10 wide receiver in the NFL? (laughs) Mm-hmm. Oh, I knew you were going to do this to me. Um, look, I, I do I do think that Terry McLaurin is, I think he's a top 15 receiver in the NFL, but I just, it's some, you can make an argument for him being top 10. You can be an argument for him being top 12. You can have, you can make an argument for him being top eight. Uh, I know that I had, I was on a podcast uh, earlier this week, the PFF NFL show, 
and Sam Monson, my coworker, he had Terry McLaurin at eight. And when I was looking at the rest of the wide receivers that were around there, it felt like eight was a little bit rich, but it's not like I think that he doesn't belong in there. I, mm. I would have put him in. Here's the way that we did it. And here's, if you ask me how you have to do wide receiver rankings, you have to do them in tiers. The very first, the tier number right. one in the NFL is Devontae Adams, Justin Jefferson, Tyree Kill. Those are the top right. three receivers in the game. You can make an argument for all three of them to be number one. And the, that's the top, that to me is that first bucket. Mm. The next bucket is Cooper Mark Cups, A.J. Brown, Jamar Chase, and Stefan Diggs. I think yeah. that's tier number two in the NFL. And then tier three is a lot of those other players in which I would put Terry McLaurin. Okay. So I think that you probably got anywhere from five to six wide receivers that are in that tier three of the NFL that gets you to, you know, 14 or 15, ranked 14 or 15. But I don't really give a damn if you're ranked ninth right. or whether you're ranked 14th. Right, I'm putting you. you in the same bucket. I'm picking all those players. So I think the maybe cop-out answer to it is I have Terry McLaurin in tier three of wide receivers in the NFL, which could be anywhere from eight all the way down to 15. But he is one of those guys that you absolutely love to build a passing attack around because he can make things happen for you. I really There's like also the... so many good wide receivers in the NFL right now. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. It's really yeah. Stupid. Uh, and I really like the way that you put that. Yeah, that makes because, sense. Because, like, you know, people argue about top 10 or not. That doesn't mean you're a bad player. You know, obviously, right. I, I like the way you kind of formatted that. The last yeah. question I have for you, sir, mm -hmm. putting you on the spot again. I know I, I, I'm really, I'm unfortunate to do this. I know it's stupid because this is June 2nd. But your prediction for Washington this season, I know you probably haven't looked at the schedule, but just based mm -hmm. on how everything is coming together, I know it's a hard division. But your prediction for them in this season, and then do you think that they have upgraded enough to win a playoff game? Ooh, what was their record last year? What did they finish? What Seven was and it? nine. Okay, so I think Seven, it, I nine, do. Oh, sorry, lost three or four very close games. I was going to say I think it's going to yeah. be a little bit better than that. Like I, I really do think that, like eight and nine, nine and eight is probably where they're looking. I, that that division is just so tough, man. Like I think that Dallas is hitting their stride. Philly's obviously an absolute house. What Brian Dable is doing with the Giants has been fantastic. So those teams, you know, it's going to be tough. And that's six games out of the schedule right there that you know you're going to have to play those teams tough. So I do still think that this is a team that absolutely could be right at 500, whether it's one game above, one game below. That's where I would That's where I would put them. I, I'm not I, – I don't think they're playoff ready yet, so I wouldn't say that they would be able to okay. win a playoff game. It, it To me, it just comes down to the experience factor. Sam Howe would have to be truly the best version of Sam Howe for them to get to that point. Maybe we do. We know there's a Cinderella team that pops up every single year. Uh, Jags won a playoff game last right. year, right? And we, hey, nobody Tim Tebow expected. won a playoff game, Trevor. That Tim, Tim Tebow <laughs> did indeed win a playoff game, but that's kind of where I've got the commanders right now, just thinking of their upcoming season. I got you, man. Sense. I appreciate yeah. you for putting me down easy, Trevor, unlike Reed sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't thank you enough for them. joining us, brother. I know I've always enjoyed your work with everything that you've done following you through PFF. I can't thank you enough for taking some time out for us and be able to talk some commanders football, brother. Of yeah. course guys you know i enjoy it and it is anytime my friends appreciate Thank you trevor you. have a good night brother you too man all right everybody we just spoke with a man of pro football focus i love trevor man it always makes you laugh yeah oh yeah and plus even though i, I don't necessarily I so awkward <laughs> i don't necessarily agree but i trevor? do understand what he's saying about terry yeah. uh, just like when you look even just like situations and stuff like i get that personally i mean i'm gonna put terry you know as close to five as he possibly can but hey i get it I understand, I understand what he's saying completely. I'm ride or die, baby. You yeah. know. And the th one thing I will caveat, I will say, is Terry has never had consistent passer exactly. right. for all yeah. the whole season, and so I do think it is kind of muddled there because I feel like Terry could be doing well what Stefan Diggs does up in Buffalo if he had Josh Amen. Allen, so to speak. Yeah. And now, Terry's been an underdog his whole life, man. Terry almost he almost didn't make it to Ohio State. He was a third round pick. Uh, he wasn't rated too high on a lot of boards, and he always exceeds expectations. So don't He's feel an bad about that. Overachiever, man. Everyone yeah. makes fun of my nickname for him, but it's true. Now yes. read this next question from Tim Towner. Intended to be for one word answers. What is your over under? How thirty seven hundred passing yards? I'm I'm gonna say you know what I'm gonna be ballsy over. Okay. I, I think there's so many weapons in EB's offense. I'm gonna I'm going to say under, and the reason for that is that I'm hoping that it's less yardage and more touchdowns more so than anything else, and allowing the guys to cut. Because everything being quick game, I think it's going to be the short and allowing the pass catchers to do a lot with the football, but also using that deep ball 
to your ability when you do need it. And obviously, Kansas City's that offense did not shy away from that with Pat Mahomes. Obviously, he's a freak of nature. He's an alien. Just yeah. saying. I'm going to go under just to be safe with it. Now, Terry, 100-plus catches. I'm going to say under uh, just because there's so many targets to spread the ball around to. Uh, that's not including the running game where you've got two, possibly three running backs that you want to touch the ball semi-regularly. So I'm, I'm going to say under, but Terry's Terry makes the most of it, and he, he has a high average. I'm going to say over. And the okay. reason for that is because what Deucet and them had told me about him being motioned in over linebackers and stuff, yes. I think that we're going to see Terry actually be utilized like a number one wide receiver d- should yeah. as by attacking the defense yeah. at their weak points. My Get the boys fired up. beautiful. When I hear Eric bien in his press conference, I'm like, dude, you should see me. I'm like, I'm like yeah. Reed on the weekends, you know, out in yeah. the South. Right. Ready, man. Right. Ready yeah. You're ready to storm the capital. Capital. You're just so <laughs> fired up. <laughs> Now, B Rob, a thousand rush yards. I'm gonna say again. I'm gonna say over. Granted, no freak accident happens uh, like last year, um, but I, I'm gonna say over. I, I think that the league sleeps on Brian Robinson still. Um, you watched him last year, man. The guy was just an energy plug for this offense. He was so he made so many big plays, and uh, he just has that it factor that you look for in a running back. I think where he's gritty, he's tough, he's big, he's hard to bring down. You know, I could see it like early on in the season. Maybe it takes him a little bit to get going, new offense. They're going to want to throw the ball. They're going to want to get Sam Howell comfortable. But at the end of the season, when those boys over on the defensive side start getting worn down and Brian Robinson starts to get going in the colder weather, I think you're going to see that dude kind of, I'm not going to say he's going to go on one of those Clinton Portis streaks, but uh, he's going to be up there and uh, he's going to, he's going to grind it out. I think uh, over. Um, the reason being is that he's fully healthy. Obviously, did not start out well, but had 900 all-purpose yards. I think he had like uh, 500 rushing yards, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I think that he can eclipse that, and especially with a young quarterback. I think Eric Bieniemy is going to early and often in this season use B. Rob in those rushing yards to help the play-action game, being able to use Sam Howell's arm strength to not not turn the football over, make things easier on him. I think B. Rob having over a thousand rushing yards is very likely. A. G. a thousand receiving yards. Under. Um, I agree. And again, I mean, I think that they're going to be able to spread the ball to him, but I, I do think that uh, it's just that's that's a lot for him. That would be nice, though. Curtis Samuel, nice. Curtis Samuel, thousand yards total. Total? I'm I'm going to say yes. I'm going to I'm going to say yeah because he's going to be used in so many ways. Uh, I could see it being where he's kind of almost just like a decoy a, a lot for some of the game, but when he touches the ball, man, he's just so electric. I'm going to say under, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Not at all. I think that his usage is going to be very crucial, and it's going to be it's going to be blatant. It's going to be for a reason, a purpose. And I don't think it's going to all focus around Curtis like we kind of saw last year where he was the only guy motioning. Uh, next one is Dotson, 10-plus touchdowns. Hey, I gotta go, I'm going to go even. I'm going to break even. I'm going to say Jahan's going to catch 10 touchdowns exactly because uh, – you just look at him, man. Last year, all that dude did was catch touchdowns for the early part of the season. He was very clutch. Uh, so I'm going to go. The, the, the dude has a magnet for the end zone, but I, I'm going to say he's going to catch exactly 10 touchdowns. Yeah, for me, I'll, I'll say over. I do think that this is the one aspect of this. And Kansas City's offense is number one in red zone efficiency last season. I'm hoping that follows Eric Bieniemy here. Jahan Dotson, we've we've heard so many times people talk about his route running, being able to create separation, and that is crucial in the red zone. I'm I'm going to see Jahan Dotson being able to be crucial in that red zone area and help this running game be able to score some points and well average more than 20 points a game. Now, last one from Tim, real quick. Read. Would you rather have Cody Barton's buzz cut or Cole Holcomb's mullet? Come on, man. Come on, man. You really want me to answer this? No. Gotta go with the mullet, baby. It's Cole's mullet. mullet is. I mean, beautiful. I wear I wear a buzz cut just because I can't Same. grow hair anymore. Because I'm but balding. This, yeah, it's yeah. not by. Well, also, you you're remember you were born without the top of your skull. That's why you always have that hat on. So, like, any hair for you would be kind of sick. It would be sick. This yeah. next question is from Yam Starch. Yam Sensei from our Discord. I missed this on Monday, and I promise that I will actually read it this time. Yam asks, since I don't believe we will take the division, who do you project to be our main competition for wild card berths into the playoffs, and why? One team in the NFC East, and then one or two out of it. Okay, so in the NFC East, I think obviously. Dallas, uh, uh, I like the Giants are good too, but they have that stupid quarterback, that dumb guy, and uh, that you know I just I still don't have any faith in Daniel Jones. So I'm going to say Cowboys. I mean the Eagles, I think got it in the bag, unfortunately. Um, but I, I like what Trevor was talking about about the Falcons. They're a very dangerous team. They were in it up until the end last year as well. I, I mean they're they're a solid 
solid group of guys that they got over there. Another team that uh, I think will be interesting is going to be Detroit. I think that I love what Detroit did this offseason, and I, I love Dan Campbell. And, uh, yeah, man, the, the D's coming back kind of like Kyle every other night, you know? <laughs> uh, for me, Tim, I, or Tim, for Yam, I think it's going to be New Orleans and Seattle. I think those two teams are have the ability to fight for those wild cards because I do believe that Atlanta yeah, Seattle, is going to take them. I am going to think Atlanta is going to take that division, but I think Seattle and New Orleans are the two teams that could be fighting for that wild card spot. They're they're kind of in the same atmosphere as we are, you know, not really over that brink yet, and they're trying to fight for that, and it's going to be one hell of a brawl. So I'm looking forward to it. Appreciate yeah. that question, Ian. That, that was made a great more one. sense. Yeah, Falcons. I, I do think will win the division, so I was probably wrong there. But hey. What are you going to do? Yep. Now this next question is from Twitter from Tony Franchise. Reed, with the extra money we now have, I think Dalton Risner could be an upgrade at left guard. What position would you like to upgrade? I'm right there with you, man. I, it's still a shock to me that Dalton Risner's not on a team. Uh, I like Dalton Risner a lot. Um, I think he would definitely be an upgrade. He's just solid, just a smart, nice, wily vet uh, that you can plug and play. Um, left guard seems to be our weakness. I do like that they're trying to give some of these young guys a chance, but uh, I would like – I think if we're going to go anywhere, I'd like to sign an interior offensive lineman. Yeah, he's probably – probably all not have a job right now because his name is Dalton. And what kind of – Dalton. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah no, that's true. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding, man. You're Imagine like... seeing a baby being like, that's a Dalton. No, that's, that's a sick name. Yeah, you name. should change his name like to Chick or something, like Chick Risner. You know, be the, Chick Risner. Cool. Oh, dude, that's such a, that guy used to bully every frat in every, every frat. college. Um, what position would you like to upgrade? I'm not really sure if I want to upgrade a position right now, but I will say this: if there's one position that you should upgrade right away, it's safety, and that's by extending Cameron Curl long term. There that's you go. the only thing that we that should be sense. spending our money on. I'm to be perfectly honest with you. I know we should be trying to get better. Everyone's gonna be saying, Kyle and Kyle Musk were yelling at you because we should have upgraded this, but I that's fine. I just want my boy here long term. We've been trying to find good safety play for many, many years, and we finally have one. The diamond in the rough seventh rounder. Please not let him leave. And I know that yeah. it's all because of the ownership change, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Now, this next one, actually, no, that's going to wrap us up. Actually, yep, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. Reed, good job, man. I think you did a Thanks. good job tonight. The tight end question to say, uh, to Fowler was spot on, sir. I will tell you that. Yeah, I mean, usually I'm trying to be uh, a distraction to distract you guys from the border crisis. But today, you know, I was like, they're already distracted, brother. They ain't gotten, you know, they don't know what to do about it. I did also see uh, Kyle in the comments. Somebody said that you should be president. And and with that, I say, what do you what would you do about Russia, Kyle? What would you do about Vladimir Putin? Is that a serious question? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> no. I'm not. I wouldn't. Don't talk to me about Putin, man. He wouldn't still be there if I was there. A, a um, lot of guys say that they can control. You guys know very well. Um, I could not be president. There would be so many issues. I, there's 10,000 more things I'd rather do than run for president. To be perfectly honest, I mean, there, nobody else would vote for me, obviously. But um, <laughs> the last thing you want to do is run for president. But I'm already losing hair. Do I want to go completely hairless on my body at this point? Uh, I kind of, yeah. A we nice, do have nice one more question. Twink. This is from Scott okay. Hartley in the UK. Oi, I'm sorry, Scott. As of tomorrow, we gain over $8 million in cap space. Do you have a particular position need that you would upgrade, or would you would use this money to sign our top two draft picks and get a deal for Cam? I oh, already okay. answered the question for you, Scott. Yeah, I was about to say, Kyle already answered it, but uh, if I would just write a check out to Michael Reed uh, for probably that whole eight mil, at least 500 thou of it, and I would just be like, here you go, bro brother. Thank you for being you. And I'd say thank you, guys. So I would just give the money to some poor young chap uh, from the U.S. of A. Yeah, and I think signing the draft picks is obviously very important. Yeah, and I'm sure right. that they are. They're that's why they're kind of mapping this out the way that they are. They're going to be able to get it done. Yeah. All right, everybody, yeah. that's going to wrap us up for this episode. I can't thank you guys enough for joining us and watching this far. If you have, you are a freaking champion. I can't thank you enough. Want to hear from you guys? What are your over under predictions? for some of these players and their yardage and what they could do this season with touchdowns and yards, uh, et cetera. Love to hear from you guys in the comments. I appreciate everyone that comments and even uh, our, what, what was the guy? Oh, what was his name? I can go think. for seven. Yeah, Groundhog go for seven. seven. Yeah, Groundhog seven. Now shout out Groundhog. Well, shout out Groundhog. Stop being such a distraction, bro. Uh, <laughs> but no, honestly, I'm here to distract you from the fact that today is pride month and i don't want anybody doing anything dumb so i'm here to distract from that and i'm saying let let the boys roll let the boys be the boys the girls be the girls the tees be the tees just let it happen brother allies we're allies <laughs> talk about me for president you should be the president what a speech that was <laughs> all right everybody that's gonna wrap us up for this episode i'm kyle and uh i am 
basically the equivalent to podcasting as the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I'm just a distraction, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a great, safe weekend. Now, Enjoy your weekend. Thank Enjoy you, Groundhog. OTAs. We'll see you guys yeah. next week, all right? Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Peace.